Welcome to Right on the Money, the weekly talk show with interviews you can use to help you maximize your money and optimize your financial future. Before moving forward with any of the ideas discussed on the show, always consult your financial advisor, insurance professional, or tax consultant. Looking for financial help or a second opinion? We can help you in your search. And now, your host of Right on the Money, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator, Steve Zavant. Well, welcome everyone to our series on America's largest single asset with real estate expert, Mike Bodine. Welcome to Ride on the Money, Mike. Hey, Steve. Thank you. It's great to be here. I'm glad you're here. I want to ask you some questions. There's a huge trend right now among millennials. I've never seen a sector since I've been around that have been putting off purchasing a home. I don't know if it's a new trend. I don't know if the market's kind of problematic for them or whatever, but people are trying to debate, should I rent or should I buy? This is always a big question. I'm thinking from a consumer point of view, you're going to give us a little bit of wisdom here. When's a really good opportunity? I should just stay and rent. I shouldn't really worry about that right now. Or when should I buy? Right now, in a lot of markets in the country, it's tough to beat um, buying or as far as renting. Mm -hmm. if, you're, uh, if you're renting uh, a home, there's a very good chance that uh, you can you can be owning a home for less money than that, but there's other factors at play. How long are you going to be in in the community there? Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself uh, two, three years or more? Because with the interest rates so low right now, that it's uh, it's it begs for people to buy because prices are just are going back up again. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about that for a second. Now, so you're saying we're we're experiencing home appreciation mm -hmm. in many of the major metro markets in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's would you are you saying it's really then a seller's market? Not necessarily because it really depends on where you're at, and mm -hmm. then it depends on where you're at as far as price range. Mm -hmm. Um, in a lot of markets, the Phoenix market where, that I'm familiar with, for example, if you're in the upper echelon price range, it would be a buyer's market. Mm -hmm. If, however, you're in the lower, you're under, say, three fifty, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000, it's a buyer's market. Okay, well, let's, uh, you just made some demarcation lines. Let's talk about that. What is the, the, you said that it's a buyer's market. Where does that demarcation line start for the, what, middle class or higher affluent clients? Well, again, it's going to depend where you are, and it's going to depend what your demographics are. If you're mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley in California, mm -hmm. you know, these folks, typical sales price in homes over there are a million dollars, million two fifty. At the front end, usually. And at the front end, yeah. exactly there. Whereas many other markets, uh, in the, whether it's Southwest or it's in the Midwest mm -hmm. or in the South, they're, they're markets that are really still uh, very affordable. So you, the big issue for us is we, we have a low interest rate environment, no doubt about that. And it's really impacting mortgage rates. I don't see the Fed really moving too fast right now. So based on that, this is a great time to lock in a low rate, no doubt about it. If I'm looking for a home purchase and I'm in certain communities, depending upon how large or value the home, I could be in a buyer's market or a seller's market. That's what I'm getting out of you. It's location and it could be the, the, the value of the home. But from a strictly standpoint, I'm sitting there, let's say I'm, only, I'm gonna spend only three years I get it. I understand. Rent is a way to go. Just get in, get out. But if I'm pretty sure I'm going to stay here, I like the neighborhood. I kind of, you know, I'm thinking about a starter home for a millennial, right? Their first home. They're not going to go crazy. They're going to buy a nice home that they can have a good beginning in. When I'm looking at that, I'm trying to trade off rent, which has a lot of freedom, a lot of flexibility versus I own a home. I got to come up with a down payment. I got to get pre-qualified. Yep, right. I also have to be able to afford the monthly mortgage payment with <clears throat> property taxes on top of it and you know, home insurance. I mean, there's a lot of things to think about. Mm -hmm. When you're dealing with young millennials, how is that approaching in your area of, in Phoenix? How are millennials looking to that when they're still struggling? Should I rent or should I buy? Well, again, it gets down to the economics of it. They're looking at it. And, and unfortunately, a lot of the uh, millennials don't really understand that they can't afford a house. That's, I think, happening all over the country. They don't realize what three and three quarter percent 30 year mortgages, and in some cases, 40 year mortgages, the, the actual down, the actual uh, monthly payment that that can bring it. People are, especially millennials, are surprised at that. Mm -hmm. So when they're looking at the, at the market there, they're thinking in terms of, can I afford this? Mm -hmm. They're looking at it almost like rent. And really, I think uh, education needs to happen for millennials. Mm -hmm before they can um, really make a, a good decision there. 
Okay, so let's let's say it, uh, if my, you're watching our show today and I'm, you're a millennial, you're saying, Steve, I didn't think I could afford it. Well, Mike just said three and three quarters could be a lockdown 30-year mortgage. You did mention, shockingly, we're, are we actually showing 40-year mortgages out in the United States now? Well, yes, they are out there. Um, highly uh, uh, not recommending those. Mm -hmm. Interest is higher? Well, you're just 10 more years. You're just adding 10 more years. You're not paying. Mm -hmm. It's really like an interest-only loan. Interest-only loan. Okay. Really. So millennials should go back out and really look at a mortgage calculator. I was out on bankrate.com prepping for the show, mm -hmm. and I just did. I just went, hey, look at these numbers. I mean, you can really get a pretty affordable home against rent. You need to price this out. I totally uh, appreciate your exhortation here because if you go out and do the calculation, how much money you can put down. Now, the requirements after 2008, you know, the big meltdown, yep. what kind of numbers for our millennials and people that are buying a home, what kind of down payment are they looking for now? Is it more benevolent now or is it it's still pretty tight? There is some more benevolence that's coming into the marketplace right now. FHA is 3.5% as a cash down payment. Bank of America just rolled out with a 3% down. That's the down payment? That's the down payment. And of course, if you're a veteran, it's zero down. And we have a lot of veterans that are really, especially now coming back into the marketplace. So really, uh, if I heard you right, really down payment is probably not the issue. Interest rate is probably not the issue, right? Because it's so low. So what's really stopping me well, from comparing your wife? If I'm going to be around for five years in this neighborhood yeah. or longer, I should be looking at home buying then, not renting. Well, the, what's really holding back a lot of millennials right now, student debt. Ah. And what always holds us back is going to be debt. But right now for the millennials, they are some of them have well over $100,000 in, uh, in student debt. And that is really killing them. And then the same old things that... Uh, prevent somebody from buying a house, and that would be credit, you know, mm -hmm. missing late payments. That's a, that's a big deal. You know, mm -hmm. your credit score is going down. You have a lower credit score, and you're going to be paying a higher rate of interest there. Even millennials, we have found, who have bought homes, um, say back in 08, uh, 07, 06, they got upside down. Mm. They had to then default mm -hmm. or do a short sale. And then there's the waiting period for that. Mm -hmm. So there could be waiting periods because of that pulls problems back there in 2009. There is waiting periods there for There is that. waiting periods. Yes. Okay. And then the second part is those, if I'm looking for trying to, to price myself into the bank and I have a hundred K in student loan debt, they're going to take that into account on whether you can pay this or not. Absolutely. Okay. So some people may be renting out of forced habit on the student loan debt alone. Correct. Okay. How do they, when I'm trying to think about, you know, I'm trying to put money aside for a down payment, although it sounds like I don't have to put on a lot. The second thing is, is well, I got to pay off this student loan if I'm if I'm a young person. And I'm thinking I'm I'm seeing people that are in their 35, 40 years. They're still paying it down. Yeah, I mean that's it's right. Okay, so when I'm looking at the mechanics, I'm a math guy. I'm going to pull out my HP 12C calculator. I'm going to sit there and say, okay, here's what my rent costs. Here's what they want in a deposit or a damage deposit or whatever. There's the number. Yep. I'm going to figure out. Go to my insurance agent. I'm going to say, hey, give me my renter's insurance. I want to cover all that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to also put on a side, as you said, here's my down payment. Boy, FHA, what would you say? Three and a half percent? Three and a half percent down. Three and a half percent yeah. down. Plus, I'm at what? What's a mortgage right now? Three, three, seven, five, somewhere around there? That's correct. For 30-year lock? Yep. So it isn't the down payment. It isn't the, it, it isn't the actual interest rate. So really, fundamentally, you could get into it, if, if again, if the debt is not the uh, issue. Now, if I'm in middle America, let's say I'm the generation X and Y, I'm in the middle. I'm not a senior, I'm not a millennial, I'm in the middle. How's the market for the people like that? We have established credit, pretty good on the numbers. We should be really looking to buy now. Uh, well, the boomers, if, you, mm -hmm. if you're, you're talking uh, for the boomer generation, a lot of the boomers got nailed in the, uh, in the, in the collapse. Mm -hmm. And they did uh, lose their homes. Mm -hmm. They did do short sales. And those people became renters. Mm -hmm. And all, all, whether it's the millennials or it's the boomers that have gone out into the marketplace and renting, what that's done is that has now created such a demand for rentals that is pushing up the price of rentals. Mm. Again, I mentioned Phoenix, Arizona. Last year, 11% rise, average rise in rental price. Unbelievable. Well, location, 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 as they always say in your gig. So we have to look at, is this a good deal? Listen, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version right online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request information from this segment. In our second segment, we're going to talk about buying a home with Mike Bodine. We'll be right back after the break.
normal unfair of American seniors is outliving their money in retirement. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. The Guinness Book of World Records for living the longest is held by Gene Kalman, who lived 122 years, 164 days, and that's a fact. But it seems like science fiction to consider living to age 150. But according to a leading gerontologist, that person has already been born. Every day in America, seniors are turning age 100. It's the fastest growing segment among retirees today. And tomorrow, you may very well be one of them. Could your retirement plan go beyond age 90, age 95, or even age 100? Now you can purchase guaranteed lifetime income no matter how long you live. And that income can also include annual increases to help maintain the purchasing power of your retirement dollar. So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free income calculator to determine how much guaranteed lifetime income you can purchase. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and our series on America's largest single asset. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about buying a home with real estate expert Mike Bodine. Mike, uh, home ownership, American dream, home sweet home. I want to own something. I want to have something that says it's my property. And most Americans will never own any other piece of real estate than their actual home, their residential home. So it's a big deal. And for many, it's the largest asset they have in their entire financial portfolio. Sometimes we forget about that. We just think it's a roof over our head. But actually, it's an asset, financial asset, in our portfolio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So talk, let's talk about how am I going to go ahead and buy a home? You know, what am I looking for? I'm the buyer. You know, sometimes it depends upon what yep. location you are in the country. It could be a buyer's market. <clears throat> depends upon where you're at. Some places, oh, no, it's a seller's market. So we just have to figure out where are we at that time, and is this the right time to be looking? If I'm looking to buy a home, I must have a little bit of down money. I must, I'm looking at the interest rates or or three, three quarters, 30 FHA lock. I mean, that's huge. Talk to me a little bit about what am I looking for as I'm, I'm buying a home? Yeah, well, uh, Steve, I think the most important thing uh, when you're buying a home is to get what we would call, in a way, cash ready. Obviously, it would be nice if you had cash. But second to that, the best thing next to cash is to, is to be pre-approved. To be pre-approved for a mortgage is almost like having cash because basically now you're going into the transaction and you're, you're saying, well, I don't have cash, but I'm approved. I'm qualified. Is your house qualified? So if, if, the, uh, if, I'm, if I'm qualified, then that's going to strengthen my position mm -hmm. as far as uh, when I bring that offer to the table. Mike, you've been in this business, I mean, 30 plus years. Tell me, how many people come ready to go pre-qualified? <clears throat> you know, uh, obviously not, not too many, but most people are not that far off from mm -hmm. being pre-approved. Mm -hmm. It's just really, these days, a person get pre-approved in 48 hours, well, pre-qualified -pre in 48 hours, and go through uh, even an underwriting process with a lender to where they know that they can make that loan in as little as a week. Okay, so do you get, isn't there a pre-qualified little letter kind of tells you so that you can hand it to the seller of the home and say, hey, I'm already pre-qualified? Mm -hmm. pre <clears throat> there is. Um, Firms like uh, Wells Fargo, for example, they have, they have one of the most sophisticated um, letters where it's actually like a loan approval there. That's mm -hmm. very impressive. Uh, mortgage brokers also will prov can provide that. But in various states now, what's happening is they're going to a particular form. In Arizona, for example, it's called a PQF, a pre-qual form. And that's where the lender fills out this form basically saying, that in their opinion, this buyer is ready to go. It is not a loan approval, but it's our first indication, mm -hmm. for example, that a seller's agent has, or that the buyer has, mm -hmm. that they can actually, with confidence, now go shop for a house. Okay, let's say I have my pre-qual ready to go. I'm, I got my information and I send it to the seller. <clears throat> I'm gonna make a bid on this house. I see the price tag, you're gonna be my agent, you're gonna give me some comps, right? You're gonna look at yes. some comparables to say, is this price in the game? You have enough knowledge and experience to say, Steve, I think you should offer, you should come in at this number. Do people actually listen to the real estate agent's recommendation when they say, here's the number? You know, because a lot of people say, I'm just going to lowball the guy. Right, right. Well, they don't listen to us as much as we would like them to. Okay. Um, but it's important that the buyer engage in the process and understand what the realtor, when the realtor is providing, well, here are the comps. For example, you're, you're wanting to come in $50,000 under the asking price here, 
but the very same house with this very same floor plan just around the corner just closed showing that the house actually was worth it mm -hmm. you know so now you're you're coming in uh, with a low ball offer is not in most most cases is not even going to be entertained and in, in uh, many cases will really tick the seller off mm -hmm. and will then put a damper on your future negotiations okay so let's say I'm willing to be reasonable in my offer and what I'm thinking about this is when I'm being reasonable and writing a sales it's like if I'm writing this bid my next thing I'm gonna say is when am I gonna take constructive receipt of the home how much money down earnest how much money should I put down to show that I'm really earnest I mean that's why they call it earnest money right. how serious am I <clears throat> that's gonna be relative to kind of the the geography where you're at again here in Arizona one uh, percent is typically an earnest money of, some, of, the, of, of the, the purchase pr price. Purchase price, okay. It would be one percent. So five hundred thousand dollar home, five thousand dollar earnest money. What some people do to maybe enhance their offer is we're not so uh, allured by uh, you know a big upfront deposit. But sometimes a good strategy for a buyer would be after they've gone through their due diligence, after they've had their inspections, now increase your deposit. Now double that deposit, go from five to ten thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and then up front you're telling the seller, "Hey, when I'm through that process, I'm going to double. I'm going to go from five to ten thousand dollars on my earnest money deposit. And if I and if I don't buy the house, except for qualifying for the loan, then you get that ten thousand mm -hmm. dollars, Mr. Seller." Okay. Well, but you just brought up a big bugaboo here: the inspection report. Now, most it's my understanding most states allow you to have a there's a there's a ten for, ten day free look or some kind of a look. I had the inspection, it was delivered to my door, and I could walk for whatever reason. It may not even be in the inspection report. Uh, again, it's gonna vary state to state. Mm -hmm. In Arizona, for example, which I think that we have, uh, we are on the cutting edge of contracts in consumerism for real estate. Uh, we allow basically, and what I tell both buyer and seller, and I let them know up front, basically this is a free look. You get, a buyer gets 10 days from the time that the contract is executed in which they can withdraw from the agreement. Now this is good. And not lose their earnest money. And not lose their earnest money. And it used to be, uh, it used to be, for example, that you actually had to have a reason to be able to withdraw. And in some states, that's the case. Mm -hmm. In Arizona and other, I think, more progressive states, they're saying, you know what, if we wanted, if a deal is going to go south, we want that deal to happen in the first 10 days. We don't want that happening at the time of closing. So if it's going to blow apart, let it blow apart in the first 10 days. But once you get past that 10 days, mm -hmm. then it's pretty much gold. Okay, so I had my inspection report. Now the next thing I'm looking for when I'm buying is I'm going to do an appraisal. And we're going to talk about this in a couple of segments later on and really get into the meat of this. But now I'm going to have an appraisal because this my, my per, that I'm buying and I, I don't have cash. So I got to go to the bank and get a mortgage. And to get a mortgage, the banks want to know, hey, is this value the same, the whatever I'm bidding for here, is that in the game on the value? Talk a little bit about that, because th that could be a deal killer in some set, sense. Well, and that's where it really gets, that's where pricing the property in the beginning is so important. And I'll explain to some clients that even if a buyer would buy your house at the price you want, the chances are, without comps, that that deal is going to get shot down by the appraiser. And then, if the appraiser doesn't shoot, around, shoot it down, it could be the underwriter behind him mm -hmm. who shoots it down there because it has to, it, there is now uh, much more burden on appraisers mm -hmm. to accurately show how they performed that appraisal because if that ha something happens to that house, it gets foreclosed on, the feds are coming, they're looking, they're going to find out why that thing got foreclosed on and oftentimes they're going to really look at that appraisal there. So for a seller, uh, Getting the right price ahead of time is so important because, again, you get somebody willing to pay the price, but it could fall. Okay, did I hear, though, that you, you kind of said comps. You're talking about comparables, homes that have sold in the neighborhood already. How important is that when you're looking at appraisal issues? I'm buying a home. I want to make sure, is this neighborhood, am I in the game on the value of this bid? Well, that's the, the, the main question. That really is a, what the lender's interested in. The buyer mostly is focused on, I want to get the house. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not really, uh, we let them know as a, as, a, as a precaution in a way that, hey, you know what, the lender's got to approve this. And if they mm -hmm. don't, then you don't have to buy the house. Mm -hmm. You can still buy it, but then you have to bring up additional money mm -hmm. to meet that gap between the appraisal and what, the down payment. 
Okay, so there's ways even to, if you have the extra money and you say, I want that house no matter what, sometimes people fall in love, right? Absolutely. And they, they're not looking at the math. They're not looking <clears> at the comps. They're just saying, hey, I want it. So they're going to have to go up with a little more money down yep. to make the right. lending institution feel safe and bring a little bit of monetary solace so they can feel comfortable with it. Yes. Okay. All right. So let's say I have all that done. I'm ready to go. What? How important is it the time? You know, between the time I say, all right, we're passing inspection, money, earnest money's down. They know I'm doing it. How long should I push the guy out, the, the, the seller? I'm buying it. Is it 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Well, that's already determined uh, in the initial part of the contract. That's going to be usually a 30 to 45 day escrow total. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or podcast, you can view the video version online at rightonthemoneyshow.com and request information from this segment. In our third segment, we're going to talk about selling your home with Mike Bodine. And we'll be right back with Mike right after the break. The Guinness Book of World Records for Living the Longest is held by Gene Calmet, who lived 122 years, 164 days. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. Will you live to be a super centenarian like Gene? Of course, no one knows how long they'll live or if their family history will be any indication of their lifespan, especially in light of constant medical advancements. But the odds are ever increasing that a significant segment of seniors may live to age 100. But without some idea of your life expectancy, it's difficult to make plans for the future, especially for retirement. While there's no exact science in computing how long you live, you can get an idea by taking a life expectancy test. Then you can use the results to create a timeline for your retirement plan. And don't forget, when you take the life expectancy test, always answer the questions as honestly as you can. So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the life expectancy calculator so you can get an idea if you're ready for retirement. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and our series on America's largest single asset, your home. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about selling your home with real estate expert Mike Bodine. Mike, buying a home's kind of cool. You know, I'm just going to, you know, 30, 40 homes I'm going to be looking at. It's kind of, it's easy. But when I'm selling my home, oh my gosh, now we're talking workload. I mean, I think I just saw the truck back up into my front door and say, you got to do some things. Let's talk about it. I come to you, you're an agent, I'm ready to sell my home. And you're going to go in there and you're going to say, you need to change the things, you know, and I've been living like this in this home and I have to change, right? Change for somebody else, not for me. So talk about the process of walking me through this as a seller. First of all, what could really help a seller ahead of time is when we're preparing comparable sales for them and showing them, for example, homes that have sold that are similar to theirs, we will also say, and this home was in exceptional condition. And then now mm -hmm. the, um, uh, the, the seller's thinking that his home uh, is in exceptional condition, and it's not. Mm -hmm. And so there is a uh, uh, there is a period where uh, reality has to come to mm -hmm. the seller, and a lot of times it doesn't happen. So a good agent can try and help their seller understand what needs to be done because at the end of the day, Mr. Mm -hmm. and Mrs. Seller, do you want more money? And the so yes. The answer is yes. But, but, so, but, but you're saying, is what I'm, I'm hearing you going, where you're going on this is, I might have to spend money to make money here. Did I just changed. hear you that? You, exactly. You, and you do it, how much money you have to spend. We're not talking about, in 99% of the cases, we're not talking about remodeling your house. Mm -hmm. We're talking about uh, uh, decluttering. Okay. We're talking about painting. We're talking about top to bottom thoroughly cleaning. We're talking about maybe painting. You know, um, so fixing things, repairing things, making sure that the buyer doesn't look at your house and see some things in there that's going to question the integrity of the house. Mm -hmm. So these are these are actually small things, but they can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. I have seen Steve. Uh, I've actually you know seen uh, some sellers cry mm. when the uh, staging consultant that we have, for example, going to their home has them be stripping all the personal components of the home, pictures off the wall, their, their kids' minor league baseball trophies. And now the, the, the woman, this gets very personal. Mm -hmm. And so it can, it's very emotional. This is the difference between a, an investment property and a home. Mm -hmm. and, but 
in the end, it's going to come down. So that's why the question is, do you want the most amount of money for your home or do you want to think nice thoughts about your home? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just say I'm mercenary and I want the money. Okay, so if I'm going to do that, that means, and you just mentioned another issue. So let's say I'm ready to declutter. I'm having the biggest garage sale of my life. I'm going through all my closets and I'm making that thing look a lot bigger because I'm taking everything out, giving all my clothes away to the Salvation Army, whoever else I'm going to do that. I'm going to declutter. And then I'm going to put a fresh coat of paint everywhere it needs it, maybe the whole place inside. I'm going to make curb appeal. I'm going to do a little landscaping. I'm going to do a backyard, fix it up. I'm going to do all those things you tell me to do, and I thus th just thought I heard you say, I have an additional thing. How important is this thing you just brought up, staging your house? You have professional people come in. So you don't do it. You have professional stagers come in. Correct. Talk about that. Well, um, you know, it used to be as realtors, we would come in and we would kind of, uh, you know, talk to uh, sellers about kind of what they need to do, the kind of the basics there. But these days, especially with um, all the home shows that are on television, mm. uh, then people want people know that when buyers walk into a house and they can see it wonderfully staged it makes an immediate impression on them and so it's important to have that home in great shape so yes we will hire some will hire uh, professionals staging consultants to come in and or stagers to do the actual work of staging it because in the end it will make them more money it, they could be rearranging your furniture they could be telling you to get rid of some of your furniture oh my gosh. How, how, do, how do people take that? Not, that's, that's rarely the case. Okay. And also, up front, we kind of want to get the temperature of our client. Mm -hmm. Is this something that might work for them? Some guys like Steve Savant may say to us, yes, I'm mercenary. I want the cash. I'll do whatever it takes. Right. You know, other people, we have to read them and say, is this going to be emotional stress? Mm -hmm. You know, there was studies done uh, uh, many years ago now, but it brought out, actually, that selling a home was akin, emotionally, was actually akin to the loss of a spouse as far as how, the, as far as how our metabolism reacts to stress. I've been married 41 years. I must be completely disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but okay, so, so I'm, I'm ready. I am. You're, I'm your guide, Mike. Hey, we're staging the house. We're staging the house. We're doing all the things to prep for this because we want the most money. We may have to get rid of furniture. We're going to have to really do whatever this person says. We may not want to live that way, but for the next 30 to 60 days, we're living that way. You have seen this time and again. The value of staging must be huge. You incorporate it into all your sales, so it must be huge in your mind. It is. It is whole. Um, yeah, and, and it's also things like pets. Mm -hmm. What happens when uh, uh, an agent calls and wants to be able to show the home? Mm -hmm. uh, are, is it ready to show in an hour? Mm -hmm. You know, so being being really uh, show ready, um, but it's again, it's if you can if you can have that house show ready, and and actually have lights on, and if mm -hmm. you've got a pool, having that water feature running, uh, then mm -hmm. it's going to make an immediate impact on that buyer who's coming through the door. Okay, so let's say we're ready to go, we're flexible, we're going to let them come in anytime they want. Aren't we? Don't have pets. Uh, if we do, we're going to have to figure out how to get rid of them for 30 days. Maybe even one of our kids will take them or some of our neighbors or something will watch it for a little while. We're doing all our, our best for one goal and one goal only, and that is to drive the most money in that sale. And that's why we're talking about prepping correctly. All right, now I'm all done. You say you're happy. You've seen it done. What's an expectation? I know markets are different, but is it going down in 30 days, or 60 days? What's typical in today's market? Well... Again, we have to say it's geography. Where mm -hmm. do you live? What price range mm -hmm. are you in? You could be in uh, you could be in a less than thirty day market. Mm -hmm. You could be in a six month market. So it's really going to depend a lot on where you're at. All real estate is local. Mm -hmm. So you you know we'll read well the National Association of Realtors says well it only takes sixty five days to be able to close on a home. That's a national average and, and has oftentimes, mm -hmm. most times, no bearing on reality within a local market, which is the same thing with values, too. Mm -hmm. Our value is going up. People's, people will hear on the news, well, National Association of Realtors says that average price has gone up. Uh, again, in their particular market, may not be the case, their mm -hmm. particular price range. So that's, that's the need uh, for a good real estate professional to be able to know what's going on in their market because mm -hmm. the, the wrong... A wrong um, upfront estimate of the value of your of your home is actually going to cost you money in the long run. Real quick, what about?
the days on the market. I just looked at these homes. Some of these are 140 days, 180 days. They're all in my price range. They look great. What's the problem with this? Well, that's a good question. Uh, most uh, MLSs, multiple listing services throughout the country, they will show, everyone knows, the amount of days that are on the market. That's no, no longer a secret. It used to be a secret. It's not anymore. So you can tell how many, how many days are on the market. And people ask that question, well, what's wrong with that house? They see the beautiful, nice photos uh, online on Zillow or Realtor.com, the MLS that their agent sends them. Mm -hmm. And they can't understand this house looks great. And then so they go and they take a look at it, but maybe they didn't look at the mapping that actually mm -hmm. shows the railroad crossing right in back of the house uh -huh. or the freeway that's, that's nearby. Or, um, you know, the house that isn't, in such great condition next door mm. you know so oftentimes you do have to go you do have to take a look at the house there but oftentimes uh with time on the market you also have to look at well where what price did they start at maybe they started at five hundred thousand dollars and now they're down to four hundred and fifty thousand dollars well at five hundred thousand dollars they were overpriced now it's 450 and as a realtor can, we can tell where the sweet spot is. Mm -hmm. When we're beginning to get showings on that property that we haven't had before, when we're getting second showings on a property and, and or we're getting offers on that property, we know that we've hit the sweet spot. We don't necessarily know that. There is another strategy to be able to take, and it's not a bad strategy, and we sometimes employ that too, because we explain to our clients, both buyer and seller, that it's buyers determine value, no one else. Only the buyer. Only the buyer. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, podcasts, you can view our video version of this right on themoneyshow.com and request information from this segment. In our fourth segment, we're going to be talking about home inspections, appraisals, and disclosures with Mike Bodine. We'll be right back after the break. Over 50% of those who have life insurance may be in the wrong rate class and more than likely are paying too much for their coverage. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. Sometimes you just need a second opinion to determine if you're actually getting the best deal. The insurance industry has just updated the mortality tables to reflect longer life expectancy, so premiums are expected to go down. And additionally, there are life insurance companies that are more benevolent if you have a medical problem than other companies. And when you consider that most life insurance companies offer lifestyle credits for those who practice good living habits, well, you could save a lot. But an additional value here is the vast majority of life insurance companies offer a free blood and urine analysis, a test that costs hundreds of dollars and with no obligation to buy. With hundreds of life insurance companies competing for your business, you could pay substantially less. So if you have a life insurance policy and you want a second opinion, just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the life insurance for a second opinion. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and our series on America's largest single asset, your home. Hello, everyone. I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about home inspections, home appraisals, and the disclosure form that the buyer, the, I'm sorry, the seller has to sell, and we're doing it all with real estate expert Mike Bodine. Mike, let's do the disclosure first. Uh, first time I did this, I'm talking way back in the 80s, <laughs> I got my first disclosure. It was like, it asked me everything in the moon. I didn't even know half of my condition of my home. I didn't even know it. Yeah. I'm thinking, like, I have no clue. Does that work? That? But I'm trying to disclose in there everything I do know. Remember, it's not so much what I don't know, what I do know. And I have to be honest about this. And if I didn't be honest about it, we could have fraudulent issues here. Right. So talk to me, the disclosure statement. The disclosure statement is a, <clears throat> a great protection for the seller. Uh, we will often have uh, sellers who will call us and say, well, how do I answer this? How do I answer that? And we, we say we have one word, truth. Just, mm -hmm. you know, just tell us the truth. When buyers look at a house and they are ooing and aahing, they are, they are getting emotionally involved in this house. They want to buy this house. Mm -hmm. Realistically, it takes a lot for that buyer not to want to buy the house. A lot of people think that the buyer is looking for a way to get out of the deal. Mm -hmm. Actually, the buyer just wants to be reaffirmed that they're getting a good value for the home, but they're falling in love with that house. So if the buyer will just tell the truth and then maybe have explanations for different things mm -hmm. and you put it out there, the buyer usually reads that as, oh, they're honest. Mm -hmm. And it gives them a good feeling about it because they're saying, boy, they disclose that. They mm -hmm. disclose their termites. 
they disclosed they had mold issue mm -hmm. there three years ago. And when they see that, they actually feel like they can trust buying mm -hmm. this house. Okay, so disclosure really, I never thought about this way. I said, like, hey, it's kind of like, you know, you have to go to the lie detector test or you know, read through this thing, this document and answer it. But it's really good protection, I guess, if I'm hearing you correctly, from the seller point of view. Absolutely. Okay, so, and by the way, when I go through this, I may look at that list and I might want to do something preemptive. You know what? I haven't attended to that in a little while. This is reminding me to do so. It's going to get picked up in the inspection report anyways. I might as well fix it. Right. Okay. If I fix things after going through disclosure, it's going to remind me of things I need to touch up the house on, not just paint and cosmetics, not just staging, but actually fix mechanical issues and so forth. Let's say that that's my wake-up call. How much will that help when I hit my inspection report? It helps a lot. A home that's in good condition is one of the great concerns that a buyer has when mm -hmm. they're looking at it. Will, it. will it pass a home inspection? We recommend to sellers, in some cases, to actually have a home inspection before they put their house on the market. If a seller's thinking about, well, okay, my goal is to sell my house in uh, 2016, latter part of the year, well, talk to someone, talk mm -hmm. to a realtor, for example, si at least six months before you're thinking about doing that. And that that realtors say, well, this is what we need to do to get your house in, in shape. And for the hidden things, hey, consider having a home inspection now that will uncover some of those. Mm -hmm. Again, and there's even home warranty companies out there that will, uh, they will actually provide not just a one-year home warranty after that, but then they will not nix the deal because of bad condition. Mm -hmm. A lot of people think that, that the home warranty will, uh, will, will pick up the slack from mm -hmm. them not telling the truth about something. For example, maybe their uh, air conditioning unit, you know, that they actually haven't had serviced in five to 10 years. Well, that's gonna get picked up in a home inspection. And then the buyer's gonna wonder, well, gosh, if they haven't taken care of that in the last mm -hmm. five years, whatever, whatever else. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, I, and, and usually in the inspection report, I'd have to pick that up anyways as a seller, would I not? It's going to get, exactly. So I'm going to have to pay for it anyways. Being preemptive, being proactive about that does you a couple of uh, uh, good, good things, especially when the uh, home inspector can bring out their report and say, you know, this has been a well-maintained home. So there's pride of ownership that brings value to the buyer. Well, and as homeowners, it's actually part of our responsibility anyway. We should be doing those things. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. we do a brain dump when we, when we move into our new home and we forget all the things that the home inspector told us would be good, good things to do on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. For example, in Arizona here, change your filters every month, mm -hmm. you know, because what will happen, especially running our air conditioners in the summertime, it's not only going to be less efficient, but it could actually then cause, it could, it could be um, a situation where a home warranty company might negate a claim based on the fact mm -hmm. that you have not been maintaining that unit. Mm -hmm. So. So there are certain responsibilities on maintenance issues, like the one you just brought up with the filters being changed on a monthly basis, uh, where in the Midwest, people would say, I, I change that once a year and be called a day. So it really matters. Everybody's different. But in here in Arizona, we have pools. And boy, there could be a lot of things going on. You could have a water feature. You could have a spa. You could have a water heater. If, and I, I, I'm asking because I had a question from one of my, yep. um, my uh, uh, email. He says, Steve, uh, if, I, my water feature, if, my, if I'm not using my water heater, and I don't want to fix it because it isn't working, is it better to just remove it, you know, and not put it out on the, as a heated pool? That's a great question, and sometimes it is. Some of our, you know, if you've got a 25-year-old pool and that system is not working, it's going to cost you a few bucks to be able to get that thing replaced. And quite honestly, in Arizona, because of our, uh, of our, of our, the, our warmth mm -hmm. in the summertime, uh, which heats our pools naturally, then it, it, most people actually don't use their heaters. Mm -hmm. And they find using their heaters actually is not real cheap. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap to run a, a pool heater, mm -hmm. especially if it's electric. Even gas is expensive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if, let's say we're willing to, we're gonna do, do all this preemptive work then, you know, and that, so the inspection report really looks great. Appraisals, what are they looking for? It seems like they're, they're not there that long. They're not like going through the furnace like the inspection guy <clears throat> is. They're looking at an appraisal. What are they doing in my home on the outside? What are they looking for on the inside? They're mostly, as far as the appraisal concerned, they're looking for value. They wanted the, the, uh, the lender has given their marching orders, support the value of this purchase price. 
That's all they're doing. They're not starting from scratch. Mm -hmm. They're not trying to uh, do a PFA, a pluck figure from the air and determining what that value is. They have a target figure. Mm. They have the purchase price, which is the target figure. $500,000, that's the purchase price of the home. The lender says support the value. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be looking at comparable sales. They're going to be doing everything that a good realtor is doing up front also, pulling those uh, comparable sales. So when we're sitting down with owners, we're saying, well, this is what, this is what the appraiser, these are the comps that the appraiser mm -hmm. is going to pull. That, and we think that they're going to be coming to this value. So we need to, that's where we need to be priced near. Okay, now when I think of appraisals, I think, you know, we are on the internet now. I mean, I can see a home with a video, complete video tour. I can see snapshots. I can go to Bing Maps, get the three-dimensional overview. I see what's on the side, the railroad tracks, you know, the, 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 the industrial complex next door. I can see all this, okay? So I got a pretty good view of this. Then I go on Zillow and I see an appraisal, <laughs> okay? Talk to me about it. You're like, people get wild about Zillow. They think, well, Mike... Yeah, I want to get what the Zillow price tells me. Uh, first of all, Steve, let's be clear. It is not an appraisal you're seeing on Zillow. It's a, it is an automated estimate of value. So there's some algorithm in the background yes. calculating some numbers, which may have nothing to do with reality. Count on it. Count on it. Oh, my gosh. So Zillow is not even a beginning spot. No, yet. I wouldn't say that. Um, actually, a lot of people use Zillow, uh, and it can be accurate, mm -hmm. but... Does Zillow know, for example, that you have or have not updated that home? Mm -hmm. Because the comparable sales, they may pull three comparable sales that uh, the home was completely updated. You haven't done any updated. Mm -hmm. So now they're saying your value is, say, $450,000 because they're comparing it with other homes that were updated that have closed. So they're sticking that value of $450,000 on yours because, hey, it's the same size, mm -hmm. same floor plan. So... Uh, in that way, it's accurate, except that, no, it might be 50 grand mm -hmm. uh, too high because Zillow doesn't know what's inside your house. Mm -hmm. They don't know what you've done. They don't know how well you've been maintaining the home. And nobody does until that day when you're going to have uh, a realtor professional going mm -hmm. through the home or an appraiser if you choose to do that. And at that point, looking at well, what's the value today? Because remember, um, buyers are the ones who are going to determine value, mm -hmm. no one else. So when we're putting a house on the market, we're putting it out at a certain price there, then, and we're not getting any activity, and it's been three weeks, four weeks, well, I think the market is speaking to us, and the market may be saying, it's not worth what you think it is. Well, remember, if you're listening to our show on radio, iTunes, or a podcast, you can view the video version right on, on, right on themoneyshow.com and request information from this segment. In our fifth segment, we're going to be talking about how to shop for a mortgage and the considerations of refinancing with Mike Bodine. We'll be right back after the break. Shakespeare once said, This above all, to thine own self be true. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and talk show host. It's difficult to make good decisions in life without knowing who you really are. And nowhere in life is this more important than making sound financial decisions. Creating a financial profile addresses your psychological disposition towards money, and that's a critical component in the decision-making process on saving, investing, and using insurance to protect your risk. Establishing your own risk tolerance is the first step in building a financial profile so you can measure your suitability for a financial product or strategy. There may be many risk tolerance tests available that can help you construct your own financial profile. One test that I use is a good place to start, and I'll email it to you free and without obligation. The test will take you about 10 minutes and you'll be able to do it in the comfort and the privacy of your own home. So just go to www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and click on the free risk tolerance test. Once you calculate the results, you'll have an understanding about your attitude towards money. Well, welcome back to Right on the Money and our series on America's largest single asset. Hello everyone, I'm Steve Savant, syndicated financial columnist and money color commentator. In this segment, we're talking about how to shop for a mortgage and the considerations of refinancing with real estate expert Mike Bodine. Mike, and earlier on in the show, we talked about, I mean, I think you said the FHA mortgage on a 30-year lock was like 375. Well, not just FHA, conventional. Oh, conventional loans. I think about that. I, I don't know if has it ever been this low in the in our history of mortgages. No. I mean, and I don't see the government wanting to, you know, we owe $19 trillion. I don't see the interest rate marking up by the Fed. 
going to go through the roof for up to 5% anytime soon. We hope not. Well, I don't see it. So we'll see. We'll see. Everybody's saying we're deleveraging and it's going to deflation, not inflation. We'll see, though. Who knows? Who knows? Well, let's talk about it. When I'm talking about a mortgage, I have a lot of shows. I mean, we talked about earlier on the, the show, man, there are 40 year mortgages out there now, 30 year mortgages. <clears throat> Some people think that 15 is the way to go. You know, it's a little bit more, but I'm paying my house off in 15 years. Some people like, I like to do a 15 year mortgage with paying bi monthly. Then I knock a few more years, a couple years off my 15. Talk about what should I look at? Should it be 30? Should it be 15? Uh, I know that you're not really a real fan of the 40. So walk me through the, the conventional of 30 and 15 first. Let's talk about that first. Well, anytime that you increase equity in your home is a good thing. So a 15-year mm -hmm. mortgage, first of all, you're going to get a break on the interest rate with a 15-year. That could be like a half percent lower mm -hmm. than the 30-year. So if you're looking at three and three quarters or four percent, you could be down to three and a quarter, three and a half percent for a 15-year. And you are paying off a huge amount of uh, interest. You're gonna you're you're gonna save on a five hundred thousand dollar loan. You'll save hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mike, in this low interest rate environment, is the spread that far between a fifteen and a thirty? So if I look at it, I'm getting that better interest rate. I'm paying a little bit more, but is it that much more with the interest rates so low? No, no, it's really not. It, no, it could be uh, uh, it, it, you could be talking maybe three or four hundred dollars a month. Wow, so it's really worth looking at. And if you did a bi-monthly payment where you're paying twice, you might be able to knock off a couple more years off that mortgage. Exactly. So if I heard you correctly, one of your, your one of your premises is, I want to create equity in my home, and what's the best way with my cash flow and my commitments on a monthly basis to do that? They even have 10 years. Some people do a 10-year uh, amortized loan, too. So it really comes down to a personal philosophy. Mm -hmm. Is my philosophy to gain equity in my house? Mm -hmm. Or am I, or is it a little tougher for me each month to be able to, to make that payment? Now, I could, for example, do a 30-year uh, mm -hmm. fixed rate and then um, pay additional you know, money each month to maybe even be paying that down mm -hmm. on what would be maybe a 15-year. If I have it that if month, I, have I can it do it. And do that, sure. Anytime you're applying additional monies onto your mortgage payment, you're paying down the principal. Straight to the principal. Straight to the principal. Okay, so uh, I, I'm looking at my uh, ability to pay. You know, when I go for my mortgage now, they're going to look at my debt, too. I mean, we talked about this earlier. My poor student debt, people are in there. I mean, we're talking about 100 grand for your, you still owe that and you're 30 years old. Wow, that's a lot of pressure. So when we're talking about going to a mortgage, I'm looking at, they're, they're going to look at about, I, I think it's a rule of thumb, but I'm, I want your opinion. What's the actual number? I'm get, Whatever my gross income is every month, what percentage should be my house payment? Well, what the banks are looking at, they're looking at a 28 to 36% spread. 28% gross, gro of gross, gross monthly gross. income. Okay. So 28% of your gross monthly income. Uh, they're looking at that as far as your principal interest taxes and insurance. They don't want to see that exceed. Mm -hmm. Then you, for all your debt, you're going to add now your student loans, your credit cards, your car loans on top of that. They don't want to see that exceed 36%. Now, getting back to that sweet little FHA loan, they will actually increase that 40, 43%. For all, for all debt. What's the distinction for a qualifying uh, home buyer if he's looking at a conventional loan versus an FHA? What's the big, what's the demarcation? Well, the, the big demarcation, first of all, is that FHA will only loan a certain amount of money in every county. Oh. In uh, Maricopa County right now, for example, I think it's $271,000. Mm -hmm. So if you're looking at getting a $450,000, $500,000 house, you're going to need to come up with a chunk of cash. By the way, now that you brought that number up, what about, jum what are jumbos now? What do they consider a jumbo mortgage? Four hundred seventeen thousand. So four seventeen. So there, there's was that. Now that four seventeen, if you exceed that, then you may be paying what more interest because you have a larger value of a home. Well, you're gonna yes, you're gonna pay a, <clears throat> a slightly more a uh, higher rate of interest mm -hmm. just because the value of the home is higher. Well, and the four seventeen, that's kind of a magical level mm -hmm. right there as far as how they're packaging their loans. Okay. So if you can stay in that sweet spot below that, your financer, you're putting down the money uh, exceeding above that line, you could actually be giving yourself a pretty good deal if you're in that middle line of buying a four to maybe $800,000 home. Right. Okay. All right. So that's a mortgage. Now, there's some unconventional thinking here on mortgage. You said 10. Boy, 120-month mortgage. Wow. What about these seven and one arms and these five and one arms? And how about this seven, uh, five and one arm and it's interest only? Talk about the, why would I use these kind of shorter uh, um, amortization schedules? And on top of it, one that says only have to pay only interest. Yeah. Only if you were insane. 
That's why you would want to use those. In a, in a market where we have sub 4% mortgages, anyone that's trying to save a quarter to a half percent, and that's really all you're saving. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if you want to do a, a what we call like a 7-1 arm, and that would be, it's going to be amortized over 30 years, it's going to be due in seven, mm -hmm. and, or, and or adjusted at seven, so, but maybe that'll get down to three and a quarter, three and a half percent. But the risk is huge that maybe your plans that mm -hmm. you have, that, oh, well, I can, I'll either sell the house or refi it in seven years. Life doesn't always treat us so well. Mm -hmm. So ma the math doesn't really make sense in this kind of environment anyways. And so that's why you're applying the insanity factor to it because it's really a math call here. Absolutely. All right. Let's switch gears now, put the clutch in, and let's go to refinancing. Now, you know, I'm in my home, I'm staying in my home. I keep getting calls from people, I get email every day. Hey, Steve, you know, you should change your mortgage. You know, I'm sitting there, I think mine's like at three, five fixed. I don't know if there's anything lower than that on the 30-year market, but I still get the calls. So if I'm looking at this, when should I refi? No, it's not worth it. Is there a time I should be in the house? There's gonna be cost. They tell me it's a no-cost refi, is it? There's, there's never a no cost. So there's going to be some cost assessed to this. They may, they, may, uh, they may add that cost actually to your mortgage there. But as far as a no cost, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, if you can get a legitimate no cost and a lower rate, mm -hmm. uh, then do it. Except understand, maybe you've been paying on this loan for seven years. And now you only have 23 years remaining in this mortgage. And now you've, refi you've just refied it. Yes, maybe you're saving a few bucks. You just added seven years to that mortgage. Back online again. You know? So really what you're saying is, okay, maybe your goal is never to be able to pay that off. Mm -hmm. But if you really want to pay off that loan, you really should be looking at adding additional payments that would reduce the principal. Okay, so, um, and, uh, so maybe the better way they should advertise is there's no out-of-pocket costs. Yes. So okay, because they may be adding the cost to your mortgage. You just don't have to physically come up with cash. Right. Okay. All right, that would be more truth in lending. That would be a little better way of explaining yeah. it. Okay, so let's say I've decided, okay, wow, you know, some, certain people, I know they're, uh, shockingly, people are paying four and a half to four seven five, and they're just finding out today, I could get down to three seven five. So that, wow, that's a whole percent. And they're gonna look at the charge. What, what do you think is the typical, I know there's, it's, it's a little odd from, from state to state, but what do you think the typical cost is to refi? Three to $4,000. Okay, so I'm gonna have to take three or $4,000, See what how low I can bring my my new mortgage payment down. Mm -hmm. Divide that into that cost, and that tells me the year I'm going to break even. Well, figure out how much you're going to be saving on mm -hmm. the new loan, and then you've got the, your cost. Say it's four thousand dollars. Now take that four thousand dollars and divide it into what that savings. That'll tell you that it's going to be okay. It will be forty five months, for example, for me to break even. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, how long are you going to be in that house? You're going to be forty five minutes in that forty five months in that house. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit, yes, it's math, but it's also crystal ball. Mm -hmm. So you got to have to kind of have a good idea, though, if you're going to be hanging around there. The longer you're going to be there, the more we should look at it. It's a possibility as a potential way of bringing some cash flow to the household. There's another way of looking at it, too, Steve, as you could probably figure out by now. I'm, I'm more of an advocate of paying down principal, okay, mm -hmm. and with a goal of ultimately owning that home uh, free and clear. One of the ways, if it's going to cost 4000 or $5,000, to be able to um, refinance that, how about taking that four to $5,000 and applying it to the principal mm -hmm. and doing it that way? That you're, it's not gonna change your payment, which a lot of people wanna see. They wanna see that lower payment there, mm -hmm. but it may just, uh, you may just wipe out another seven or eight years off of your, off of your loan. You're saying your that, let's just make sure I got you there. If I took the same $5,000 that would have been applied on a refi cost and I put it directly against principal, it could actually have some, how many, um, some, some years Well, here. again, it's going to depend on what the balance of the loan is there. Sure. But that, it, it could take off a significant amount of months wow. and even years off of that. Well, that's our show for this week. I want to thank Mike Bodine for being my special guest. But before I go, remember what the good Reverend John Wesley once said, make all you can, give all you can, save all you can. I'm Steve Savant. We'll see you next week right here on Right on the Money. For more information on this week's money topics, just go to our website at www.rightonthemoneyshow.com and follow Steve's daily postings on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. When it comes to retirement, money management, small business, insurance coverage, college funding, or budgeting, we have the interviews you can use.